the 1950s, and a contented post-war Britain was in the grip of a brutal moral backlash. It was against homosexuals when they were labelled pansies and queers. I regard homosexuality as a cancer eating into the roots of ordinary, decent human relations. I'm sentencing you to seven years. Every year, a thousand men were sent to jail for homosexual offences. The maximum sentence for buggery was life imprisonment. A great many people that I, that I know of committed suicide when they were caught. It was such a, such a stigma, such a, such a terrible thing to be gay. Then, a sensational trial involving a leading Fleet Street journalist and Lord Montague of Bewley electrified the nation. Its outcome so shook the establishment that life and the law for homosexuals would never be the same again. In the wake of a scandal, Churchill's government set about thinking the unthinkable, reforming the law on homosexuality and prostitution. The forum would become celebrated as the Wolferden Committee after its chairman, John Wolferden. And indeed, this is the point at which the uh, set. I'm dreadfully sorry, Mr. Wolferden. Um, Mrs. Cohen, I was, I was just saying that the aim of this committee is to determine whether the law should be changed for homosexuals and prostitutes, and to find out why there's been an increase. The increase has been down to police arrests. We carry on at this rate, we'll have an overcrowding crisis in the prisons. Thank you, Mr. Rees. Perhaps we should examine the facts and the evidence before we draw any conclusions. It's a fascinating subject, albeit a rather distasteful one. Bearing in mind the presence of the ladies, can I suggest we call the homosexuals Huntleys and the prostitutes Palmers? Would you be so kind as to tell me what a Huntley does? Or rather, what is the crime? It was announced from Sandringham at 10.45 today that the King passed peacefully away in his sleep earlier this morning. In 1952, Peter Wildblood, a 28-year-old high-flying journalist for the Daily Mail, was waiting by a London underground station. What followed would change the life of every gay man in Britain. Have you got a light? Sure. Thanks. You want to leave? Am I that obvious? Where are you stationed? At Ely Hospital. Do you have somewhere to stay tonight? Well, I was thinking of trying the Union Jack Club. I have a flat. It's uh, not too far from here. Sounds perfect. doing? Just checking we didn't wake the neighbours. Wouldn't it be funny if your neighbour had his ear to the wall at exactly the same place? Not particularly. I'd have found the police by now. Shut 
Surely the law is a deterrent to such unnatural practices. An interesting point, Mrs. Cullen. But if there was a law against men and women having sex, do you think that would stop anyone? In the 1950s, um, you knew the police were there, you knew the law, and you knew they were getting tough. But I suppose probably being young, one just said, OK, we can go on living, and it'll never happen to us. No gay man dared to come out publicly in the 1950s. But London held the promise of an exciting gay underground with its backstreet pubs and illicit clubs in the West End. For gay men encountering it for the first time, it was a passport into a secret world. George Montague was convinced that he had some rare affliction until he stepped into this underworld for the first time at the age of 21. I shall never forget the very first time I walked into a gay club in London called the Festival Club. I was 25 and I'd been fighting this thing for about four or five years and well, what the hell is wrong with me? Why am I like this? I must be the only one. I walked into this room, large room with about 50 men in there. We're all criminals, but we could be raided at any time. And immediately, the most wonderful two or three hours of my life. You were pretty certain you were going to meet somebody you knew. And it was, I think the word to use, it was sort of a little sort of Freemason world. We had secret ways of communicating. Elie calf, you know, a vile face. Oh, look at the Elie calf on that, you know. I loved the idea of a secret society, an underground thing, uh, which we shared. West End newsreel cinemas were another place for chance encounters in the dark. When Michael Brown, a 20-year-old dental student, first went to one in 1952, there was no shortage of opportunity. There was someone on my right who pushed his knee against my right knee, and then it happened on the left side, and then a hand came from behind, and then, lo and behold, a, a hand came from in front onto my knee. I was quite startled. Fear of arrest and jail prevented many from taking someone home. And fear of blackmail made sure the sex stayed anonymous. I met a man, took him back. Sex went quite well, and he, he was in my situation. He wanted, didn't want to give his name, or a real name anyway. But uh, at the back of my mind was, uh, could this be Mr. Wright? which was very important to me. That's what I was really after. It was an agonizing dilemma. Risk exchanging names or lose Mr. Wright. Uh, can I get you some coffee? Well, thanks. Make it going. Well, if you're in London and need a place to stay. Thanks. Um, here. Here has my work number. Thanks. Make sure the landlord doesn't see you. OK, Pierre. I'm Eddie. Eddie McNally. Yes, of course, Mrs. Schofield. The editor requests the pleasure of your company in his office. Did he say why? No. Been a naughty boy, have you? In 1952, the Daily Mail was a serious establishment newspaper. Its opinions were highly respectable. Its leading journalists, too, were public figures expected to have impeccable private lives. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise your glasses to Peter Wildblood, our new royal correspondent. Well done, Pete. Peace. Thank you, Peter. Congratulations. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
When I got up, it's three o'clock in the morning. The wife's still up. She's waiting for me. I'm thinking this is it, Stan. Your number's up. Good night, love. Good night, love. Good night. Thank you. So she came over. She said, you reek of perfume. You're having an affair, aren't you? I said, no, I told her. I'm doing this secret undercover job, and I have to pretend to be a pansy, and I have to put perfume on so I smell like one of them. She only bloody believed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not for me. No, I've, I've got to go. I want more for the road, Pete. No, really, I can't. You've got a date, haven't you? Maybe. It's a Scottish nurse, isn't it? No. Someone else. Yeah. <laughs> With nowhere else to go, many men went for the risk of cottaging for anonymous sex. The cottage, of course, is a public toilet uh, used for pickups and sometimes for having sex on the premises. And uh, they were everywhere in the 50s. It is very simple, this lying in the state of a dead king and of incomparable beauty. The slow flicker of the candles touches gently the gems of the imperial crown. Even that ruby that King Henry wore at Agincourt. It touches the deep purple of the velvet cushion and the cool white flowers of the only room. I'm romantic. I don't really like sleaze, but the situation forced forced me into sleazy things for fear of, well, for, for personal safety. Cup of tea, Mother? Yes, please. Father? Yes, please, Peter. My first front page. Oh, thank you, Peter. Oh. Can I keep this? Yes, it's for you. Elizabeth's only 25. All that responsibility and so young. She's always got Philip to turn to for support. You could do with someone supporting you. Behind every successful man, there's a supportive wife. There are many successful men who are not married. Besides, I don't really see the point. I'd only be deceiving myself if I lived with a woman. The trouble with you, Peter, is you've spent too long living on your own. It's not natural. My parents never knew. I didn't come out at all to anyone until my mother had died, and then I did. Uh, and that was 1982. The thing was unspeakable. It didn't get talked about at all. Everyone was in the closet except Quentin Crisp, as far as I know. You just... You, you just live... a lie. That's what you're living, a lie. You, 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 you act. You have to learn to act and, and, and not give yourself away. May I first of all say, Lord Helsham, how very grateful we are to you for finding time to come here and help us in this extremely complex and difficult matter. May I ask members of the committee if they have any points to raise on the paper? Uh, I have one or two points I'd like to ask. The first one of which is how you reached the conclusion on page one that all homosexuals are made and not born. Well... From 1938 to 1954, there has been an increase of the order of a multiple of four, which is actually a conservative estimate. This increase must be down to something more than congenital factors. Lord Hailsham, do you think that the increase in court appearances corresponds to an increase in behaviour? Undoubtedly so. Quite obviously, the war created a situation in which many people who had not been homosexual before 
in peace time, found it happening. They were away from their family and their homes for a long time. I'm, I'm sorry, Lord Herschel, I'm not sure I follow you. Well, in the Middle East, for instance, of which I have had personal experience, there were a number of cases. You see, troops catch it, then spread it on when they return home.